Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Richard Greenwald, biomedical engineer, adjunct professor of engineering at MIT. He's a leading concussion researcher. He's developed the head impact telemetry system, which has been very valuable in football and hockey to better understand force transmission to the head. Dr. Greenwald. Thanks to Mike and Ainsley for the opportunity to share with you today some of our data related to quantifying head impact exposure uh, in ice hockey. Uh, for brief disclosure, uh, I do have a financial interest in some of the technology that was used to collect this data and wanted to make sure we had that disclosed here. So of the many, many important problems that we're going to be addressing here in the next two days, I wanted to focus some comments on the issue related to exposure to repetitive head impacts uh, in hockey, and in particular, two very clinically relevant topics, one related to overexposure and the second related to underreporting. So with the idea of um, knowing that there are many, many subconcussive blows to the head, the bottom line is we don't know yet how important and at what level and what frequency these impacts can lead to certain injuries, both short and long term, but there's growing evidence that the long term incidence is not uh, good for you. Secondly, it's been reported by Mike McRae and many, many others that most or a vast majority of what might be diagnosed with a concussion do not go reported by the athlete, and we should address these issues. My background is in biomechanics and uh, like to understand the mechanisms of injury and then use those, that understanding to better understand how to uh, help reduce the incidence of injury. And we've done this in many sports and often with imperfect information. So the anterior cruciate ligament injury in, in sports and soccer um, has been around for a long time. It's been studied very hard, and you know recent advances have allowed us the idea of perhaps neuromuscular training to help reduce the injury, uh, the incidence of that pretty horrible injury. In baseball and youth baseball in particular, a lot of understanding about shoulder and elbow injuries led to the implementation of pitch counts more recently, and these are mandated at the youth level and they're watched pretty closely at most other levels. You always hear on the TV about people counting pitches. Is there a similar opportunity for us here with repetitive brain trauma? Well, first, I think the issue related to awareness is now coming to a head, and everyone's starting to be aware of what's going on. What can we do from a biomechanical perspective? We can certainly look at tackling techniques. We can look at how to improve the equipment. And I'd like to share a little bit about monitoring the head impacts that the athletes are actually getting on the playing field. <laughs> So most of you know that we've been collecting impacts for uh, a number of years now with instrumented helmets, and I'll, I'll be a little more specific about that in a moment. What we're trying to do is collect a record of head impact exposure, which is the number of impacts, the frequency, and the severity of those impacts, the magnitude and the location. So simply put, how often, how hard, and where are these impacts occurring? And then secondly, we like to uh, provide a method for alerting the sideline to address the issue of uh, under reporting when you get head exposure, head impact exposure that exceeds some predetermined limit, whether it's just on one impact or a cumulative series of impacts over time. And the idea is to go seek medical attention. This technology is certainly not diagnostic. The history of uh, head impact biomechanics is long. Many people in this room have participated, but I think what's most important is that the uh, coming together of many different branches of science have uh, occurred in the recent years, imaging advances, finite element modeling advances, um, understanding of the pathology of the brain. All of these are coming together very rapidly, and I think that's why there's been such a, a rapid improvement in what we're doing and what we understand. I think we're early on, and we have a lot to learn. The HIT system technology, um, for those of you who don't know it, includes little accelerometers, they're the same as the airbag accelerometers in your car. They get mounted into the helmet. You can barely see them here. They press up against the head, and they record all head impacts that occur in practices and games. Um, and all that information is stored on the helmet, then wirelessly transmitted to the sideline, where it can be reported uh, into a database for future analysis. We also have the ability to alert to the sideline in real time uh, of these types of impacts. I want to remind everyone that we are measuring head and not helmet acceleration. It's real important to keep track. If we put accelerometers on the helmet, we would see this. 
This is what we get compared to the hybrid three test dummy in the laboratory. We believe that we're measuring head acceleration, which is the relevant variable related to brain injury. And that work is courtesy of uh, Sarah Manugian at Virginia Tech. So everyone always wants to know, what is a 100G impact? And I could be talking about rotational accelerations in radians per second squared. I'll focus most of my talk here on linear acceleration. Um, but we can measure rotational acceleration as well and report it. So here you go. It's not a great great impact to see, but it was pretty simple. It was just a player getting knocked down. We just saw Paul's NHL videos, which are much clearer. I can play that again. Player hits the back of the head on the ice. That's a 100G impact to the back of the head. So it doesn't have to be one of these um, very violent collisions between two players. Ooh. Getting ahead of ourselves here. So we've been recording um, many impacts over time, and uh, I'm not going to be able to present it all today. We have information by sport. We have it in hockey, which is what I'll present today. We have data for football, boxing, and soccer. We have information by gender, which is relevant here in hockey, since we have men's and women's, boys and girls hockey. We have information by player position, by game versus practice, as Bob had mentioned earlier, by the level of play, and by diagnosed concussions versus, and also um, measures where athletes have been shown to have cognitive decline. Everyone always wants to know about the concussion data first, so I'll just briefly touch on that. Um, and this data actually is the football and the hockey data combined together. We have 90 plus incidences of diagnosed concussions with instrumented helmets to date. These concussions in general usually follow an impact that's of the most severe or in the top 0.5% of all impacts that we've recorded. You have about a 12 times greater odds of sustaining a concussion, a diagnosed concussion, with every 50 Gs increase in peak linear acceleration. And in football and hockey, many, many of the impacts, the linear acceleration, are highly correlated with the rotational acceleration. So again, I could report these in rotational units as well you're five times more likely to get a concussion from an impact to the front of the head to the back of the head. And you can see the distribution of impacts um, around the head for diagnosed concussions. What is the average linear acceleration for a diagnosed concussive event? It's around 107 Gs. What we're looking here is peak linear acceleration on this axis and the percentage of all impacts that we've recorded. What this shows you is the vast majority of impacts are be below 50 Gs of linear acceleration. Here's your 107 number, and we're in the below 1% of all impacts. But we've recorded over 7,000 head impacts greater than that where there was no diagnosed concussion. And since the entry point into almost every research study is you had to have a diagnosed concussion, think of all the information clinically relevant about these athletes that we might be missing for all of those impacts where they weren't diagnosed with a concussion. Just something to think about. In football, we've recorded something around 1.5 million head impacts. In hockey, we're up to about 60,000 um, on about 200-something players on 10 teams. Some of these are uh, the work done by Kevin Guskowitz and Jason Mihalik at various schools. Bill Montalpar, Michelle Kitely in Canada have been doing it. And we've been focusing on the college teams uh, local to us over the past several seasons. Just some brief data here to respect our time. Um, in general, we're looking here head impacts per athlete exposure. So every time they go on the ice for a uh, practice or a game as a percentage of all players, and we see that male hockey players sustain twice as many head impacts than females. We needed to count that. And on, in general, you're seeing about half the players are getting three impacts per game or practice. Likewise, we're looking at how many head impacts per season are we seeing, and this is on the order of uh, four to six hundred for some players, but the vast majority are in the two to three hundred head impacts per year. Let's just contrast that briefly to football, where we're seeing some players exceeding fourteen, fifteen hundred head impacts per season, and the number even grows a little bit if you look at some of the high school players who play both offense and defense. So we're seeing a lot less impacts in hockey than we do in football. In terms of the magnitude, um, males sustain impacts resulting in higher linear and angular accelerations than females. Um, these are statistically significant. We don't know the clinical relevance just yet. But here you see, again, men and women, linear acceleration and rotational acceleration here. Male hockey players are 1.3 times more likely to sustain an impact greater than 100 Gs. 
30 percent more, and 1.9 times more likely to sustain a high level of rotational acceleration exceeding 5,000 rads per second squared. So again, we have tons of data that we could report, a lot of questions about where uh, the impacts occur. Most impacts are to the front and to the back of the head. They're similar by gender across sport. And the highest severity, or most, a vast majority of the uh, highest level severity impacts are occurring to the back of the head, and even more so with the women than with the men. Some interesting findings, and you can take a look at this a little more carefully in a poster that Jonathan Beckwith has out uh, in the lobby. So we're, we're trying to understand, is there a relationship between some of these head impact biomechanics metrics and what you might see in terms of cognitive um, decline that could be measured with a neuropsychological test that occurs on the field? What we're trying to see, are there predictors using just the biomechanics alone? And this is a receiver operating characteristic curve. If we were just guessing, it would be that dotted line. You'd love to see a curve that goes straight up to one and across. And what this shows is that the biomechanical data are beginning to predict. This is actually statistically significant, but I don't think it's good enough yet. We have too many false positives. We're able to basically predict in some athletes that they will have cognitive decline, asymptomatic, but they will have cognitive decline on uh, the neuropsych testing based solely on their number of hits on the combination of hits and accelerations that they've taken and their head impact location, which is captured in this variable that we've published in the Journal of Neurosurgery called hit sp So these are subjects who are diagnosed with concussion versus undiagnosed athletes versus non-contact athletes that we look at, and we're trying to predict their cognitive decline. We're early on yet, and again, there's a lot of work to be done here together with our colleagues who are in the room. The outcome of this is that head impact exposure prior to cognitive testing is sensitive to measures of abnormal cognitive decline. So what are we trying to do here? What we'd like to do is provide some tools that are available to the medical staff on the field to prevent these issues of overexposure and underreporting. If we can identify the injury, you can't see the, all the concussions. The obvious ones are there, and we all see them. But what about all those that you can't see? We want to provide that injury information so that people will seek medical uh, attention and provide some key information for the medical staff to help guide their decisions. Our goal is to look at the short and long-term effects of head impact exposure on injury over time. We propose to alert the sideline when the impact frequency, magnitude, and location exceeds a typical impact profile. So with all this data, we now know what's, quote, normal, and we know it across different age groups at different levels. We know it by sport and by gender. We can start to apply this to um, how we would set an alert threshold. Again, I want to remind you that this is not diagnostic. This is just a tool to alert the sideline that something's happened to that athlete that's out of the norm and it should be looked at. These alerts can be based on single impacts or on cumulative impacts over time. And we obviously need ongoing research to correlate these with the clinical outcomes. This is being done by our group, funded by the National Institutes of Health, and by many other groups, many of whom are represented here today. You know, we just got to keep lurking towards this issue of prevention um, because that's what it's all about. We'd love to prevent this injury as much as just allowing it to occur and then dealing with it afterward. And I respect all the work that everyone in this room has been doing for many, many years on both sides of that coin, and we should all continue to work together. There's millions of people, um, I'm actually going to stay on time here, which is good, um, that are involved with this, and I'd specifically like to acknowledge my colleague Jonathan Beckwith, the director of research at Simbax, who's here today, for his uh, artful ability to manage about a million and a half impacts that come in uh, to our lab and understand them, keep track of what's a good impact and not a good impact, and uh, allow us to provide this kind of data. And then a long list of funding sources and research partners um, that we do, that we work with. Thank you very much.